Hey class, uh, I hope you had a, a good long weekend, or if, if you were able to have a long weekend, uh, that you were able, you enjoyed it. Um, so uh, we're going to move into the third phase of the class. So the first uh, phase was um, theorems and definitions and uh, trying to understand kind of the, the groundwork of discrete math. Uh, phase two was programming, which was shorter uh, than usual, I think, because of the, the snow and the... Uh, uh, and then spring break and everything kind of got crunched together. Uh, so there'll be a little bit of overlap with that. And, and the third phase, which is um, constructing proofs. Uh, so uh, whenever we study calculus or trigonometry or um, geometry, I think geometry is probably the introduction for most people into uh, formal proofs. Um, it, you know, proofs are, uh, bit of a drag so up until then we're uh, discussing equations and uh, just uh, how to get a single number out of this thing out of this word problem out of you know, this uh, arithmetic problem um, and then uh, we switch over to using variables that we say well uh, you know this relation actually has a solution for any number that you pick you can plug in any number you want uh, and then uh, in my case, I switched over to geometry just after that, and then went back to algebra. Um, and uh, that was when I got my first introduction to proof. So prove uh, you know, that these two triangles are congruent. Prove uh, that this angle over here is equal to this angle over here. If you have two parallel lines and a bisecting line, you know, what what postulates and, and what theorems are you relying on? Um, and uh, it was just really dense for me. I um, I really struggled with it. Uh, geometry was my first B in math, uh, and I was devastated. I thought I was uh, I, I thought I was dumb. I, I thought I could no longer do math anymore because of this this B. Um, anyway, uh, and so uh, I I you know had no particular fondness uh, for proofs. Uh, I guess until later on. Um, you know, once you get far enough along, then uh, you know the proof becomes your answer to a question. Right? Like, you know, is this thing true? Is this thing that you know I, I can look at, I can see, I have this intuition? Is it actually true? Is the statement true? Uh, and then the proof becomes your friend. It's the the thing that tells you concretely, like, yes, you know, this is this is actually what you're looking for. And then in the world of computer science. Um, it's still the answer to a question. So in some sense, unit tests are a proof that it handles you know, certain valid input correctly. Uh, and then uh, that, uh, that it uh, will err in some predictable way given other you know, uh, valid input parameters, but uh, which are maybe outside the scope of what that function is designed to handle. Uh, so if you have a, a function that returns a square root, uh, and you pass in a negative number, um, yes, you can pass into the world of complex numbers, but if your return type is promised to be a double or a float, um, then uh, then a complex number is not a, a valid return type, and so you have to throw some exception. Uh, so even though the input was you know a double as expected, it uh, fell out uh, outside of, of what your function was designed to handle. Uh, and so, um, Unit tests are, are a kind of proof that we're handling these things, uh, but more abstractly, uh, we uh, it, it's nice to develop the ability to list all of your assumptions that your program makes, uh, and where you handle those assumptions or you know where exceptions should be thrown, uh, so that uh, you can prove that if your program is used, you will never corrupt the data that you are responsible for managing. And at, at some level, uh, every service that we provide as software engineers and software developers uh, is comes down to managing some data, <laughs> some form of data, uh, some variety of it. Um, either we're processing it, uh, or we're persisting it, uh, or we're keeping it secure or communicating it. Um, and, and so uh, it's it's this uh, this concrete thing that we're we're manipulating, uh, and uh, and we want to prove that that we're handling it. And so uh, the habits that we develop in 
making these mathematical proofs where we uh, where we list our assumptions you know let a be some uh, variable from the real numbers or some variable from the complex numbers or, or whatever right you list your assumptions right up front uh, you uh, include references to any definitions or terms that are that you're going to be basing your work and your results off of uh, and then uh, you make your logical arguments that if you know this loop is executed or, or so forth uh, that you know the data is not written until it can be written in some transactional format it's passed fully into the database the database manages the traction transaction from that point uh, and you know the result is not returned to the user until we get that response from the database so that uh, there's 100 percent agreement across the line if uh, if no response is received then it you know failed somewhere else along the line but even during failure we guarantee that it's not in some corrupted state either the entire transaction concluded and we just weren't able to respond to the user or uh, the none of it it was all wiped out or rolled back or uh, the request never even made it to the server uh, and uh, and the user knows that from some timeout operation right so everywhere along the line we can guarantee that every situation that uh, that our program could find itself in is handled in uh, some reasonable way and you know even better in uh, some way that is uh, acceptable to the user or, you know, that provides some nice user experience that's you know, kind of uh, the ultimate goal in, in satisfying your users is uh, they have to feel like it's working and it works smoothly and, and they don't mind using your, your software uh, and again so that process those habits are, are really developed uh, from these uh, more uh, these these um, more direct proofs where you're actually just proving some logical assertion. Um, so uh, let's jump into to the section. Uh, the last section of the notes uh, is on constructing proofs, and it's just uh, some of my notes, uh, some of the the things that I roll around in my head whenever I, I need to, you know, move in some direction. Uh, it, so there's this, you know. Uh, sequence of questions that you ask or you know is this can this be related to something similar that I've seen before uh, and we'll take a look at uh, a few proofs and uh, you know see how they're constructed uh, how we can carry the arguments further uh, you know where um, uh, conjecture and speculation uh, lies in this uh, and uh, how we use that to progress as well um, okay let's hop over Uh, whoops, sorry. There we go. Uh, okay. Maybe one more. Uh, all right. So as I was mentioning, um, usually we um, we just put something together, and then once we can show that it's working, we tend to move on for the sake of expedience. Uh, but I, uh, you know, as, as I've been trying to emphasize throughout the semester, uh, maintainability is, uh, is a very desirable uh, goal for the code that we develop. Uh, it's not enough to get it working. At some point, if it works and we're able to, uh, to sell it or release it to the public or, you know, open it up to users <laughs> in some sense, uh, we, um, we want it to work. Whenever it finally gets a user base, it, it needs to work. Um, and uh, if it doesn't, then uh, the users will uh, crush the developers. They'll, <laughs> they'll use it, they'll find that it doesn't work, and they'll abandon it uh, before the next release cycle completes and, and before you can really make up for it. Uh, so you want to be able to prove you know, that your, your code is going to work whenever it, it gets a user base. Um, there's still unexpected things that are always going to come up, um, but that's also part of it. You want to know where, uh, if if either your app or your site or whatever starts to struggle under certain conditions, uh, you want to know what you're going to have to do to handle those cases, and so it uh, it keeps you on your toes for that big launch date. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, let's take a look at some of previous proofs, right? or just a, a, a broad survey. Um, 
Okay, so uh, this is an, an assertion. You should be able to prove um, that one is not equal to zero. Uh, and so it seems that this is self-evident because we've defined them to be different numbers. Um, but uh, whenever uh, mathematicians wanted to, to formalize uh, algebraic arguments, so uh, rather than focusing on geometry as, as uh, the Greeks did, uh, they wanted to formalize algebra and they came up with a collection of axioms of self-evident truths and these are analogous to the postulates and uh, the uh, geometric proofs that you would have studied in, in geography or uh, geometry pardon um, and so uh, you'll notice that uh, you know from these axioms from these nine basic truths that the rest of algebra has built up that none of them actually indicates that one and zero are not the same uh, but let's take a look at these axioms you know <laughs> by their name so four of the nine uh, are related to addition so there's this guarantee that you can stick parentheses around any pair of numbers that you're adding, and it doesn't matter which order you add them up in, uh, you end up getting the same result. Right? So that's uh, associativity. Okay? Uh, commutativity is, uh, it, it means that you can swap them around. So just like we're able to pair up uh, you know, these sets from uh, and apply these binary operations like addition or subtraction or whatever which only take in two elements uh, we can group them you know uh, by adjacency and, and it doesn't change the result uh, but we can also move them around uh, whenever we're dealing with uh, a commutative field uh, like um, complex numbers or real numbers or rational numbers or integers uh, although only the the complex numbers and the real numbers are uh, fields in the proper sense. Um, <laughs> very tedious. Don't want to go off on that uh, just just yet. Uh, okay. Uh, so commutativity means that they can commute. They can move around. Associativity means we can group them. You know, we can group any adjacent pair, and it doesn't matter which order we apply the operations. The result is the same. Uh, and then the existence of an additive identity, which is zero and the existence of an additive inverse, which is just negative whatever we've got. Right? So that the number plus its inverse is equal to zero, is equal to that additive identity. Right? And then we have four multiplicative ones, and you'll see that they're exactly the same thing. We have associativity with respect to multiplication, commutativity with respect to multiplication, an identity and an inverse. So it's the same thing twice, once for addition, once for multiplication, and those are the two operations. Now, <laughs> if you're like me, then you'll say, well, no, you know, there's, there's more, right? You can take roots, you can subtract, you can divide, uh, you can take powers. There's more than those operations. Um, and uh, now, <laughs> that's really why you spend calculus learning. Is, now, it really just comes down to these, right? So subtraction is addition by a unique element, which is an additive inverse of some positive number. Right? So... Um, so we view everything as, as having this natural canceling pair, uh, and um, but it's still addition whenever you add that canceling value. Uh, so uh, the existence of the additive inverse takes care of negative numbers, uh, and then um, you know we have the additive identity as well and the multiplicative identity. So the additive identity is zero and the multiplicative identity is one. Uh, and so now we can view one by a different name. So it's not this thing that we've always known as one, you know, one apple, one pie, or whatever. It's now the multiplicative identity, okay? And then zero, likewise, has another name. It is the additive identity, right? The number which, if you add it to anything, you get that original value back same as the multiplicative identity. If you multiply it by anything, you get that original value back. So prove that these two identities, the one that covers addition and the one that covers multiplication, are not the same identity, that they have to be distinct. Okay. Uh, and then there's uh, one more axiom that we didn't discuss before we move on to demonstrate this. Uh, 
And so uh, that's uh, distributivity. And so we have the four additive axioms, the four multiplicative axioms, and then the one that relates the two, right? So addition and multiplication are related by the distributive property. So A times this stuff that's in parentheses is equal to A times the first thing in parentheses plus A times the second thing in parentheses. Right? So that's how addition and multiplication relate uh, in the field axioms. Okay, so now we're trying to demonstrate that the multiplicative identity of 1 is not equal to the additive identity of 0. And we're going to do this by contradiction, which is uh, sometimes it's the easiest way to, to make a proof, sometimes it's the only way. Uh, and so we make an assertion which we intend to contradict later. Right? So assume that they are the same. Assume that both identities can in fact be the same number. Uh, and we've just been doing it wrong this whole time. You know, we, we thought 1 and 0 weren't the same thing, but if we, we make the multiplicative and the additive identity the same thing, then we unlock this new greener pasture to mathematics. So let's assume that that's possible. So then uh, choose some number a, and we have it that it's in the field f, right? But f you can think of as either the real numbers or the complex numbers. So choose some real number a uh, that's not 0 then uh, the multiplicative identity times a is going to be equal to a. But hey, we've unlocked you know, greener mathematics. So now 0 is also the multiplicative identity. Right? These are the same thing because we've assumed them to be the same thing in you know, this better form of mathematics that we're trying to show is possible. Okay. Uh, well, it's still the additive identity. And 0 plus 0 is still going to be 0. Right? So we can make this substitution. Right? And so now we have this. And then, well, we just distribute the a to both zeros, and now we have 0 times a plus 0 times a. And now we have 1 times a plus 1 times a, because, hey, 0 and 1 are the same thing. So we can just substitute those out anytime we want. Right? Uh, and then, well, that's just a plus a. So now we have that a is equal to a plus a. Uh, and if we subtract a from both sides, then on the left-hand side we get 0, and on the right-hand side we get a. But the only condition we made whenever choosing this was that a was not equal to 0. So either every number in our field is 0, or the additive and the multiplicative uh, identities have to be distinct. So again, it is possible to create this greater mathematics where the additive and multiplicative identities are the same if every number is zero. That is, if you have a field which consists of just a single number, the number zero. So it's it's this trivial condition, it's this trivial exception. And <laughs> if that's not the case, then, then these are distinct numbers. Right? So, uh, so we've reached our contradiction. Um, Right, except in the case where it contains a single element. Uh, so I've always found that proof to be really difficult, <laughs> actually. I, I always have to look it up. I can never remember just off the top of my head how to do it. I remember it's simple enough that I should know how to do it. Uh, but uh, beyond that, I just uh, keep it in mind as uh, this example of something that is, uh, it's this really simple statement. It's something that we all know to be true. But because we're so certain that it's true, we've never bothered to prove it. And so proving it, this you know, thing that, that seems so obvious, uh, you know, turns out to be really difficult. And that can be the case, where these, these really obvious statements turn out to be uh, extremely difficult to prove. Uh, OK, so let's do one more from, uh, <laughs> from these uh, elementary real analysis uh, problems. Uh, okay, so this one we can't prove directly from the axioms, uh, but we need we would have to prove three intermediate claims first. So you'd have to prove these separately, but we're just going to assume them. So the first thing that we we need in order to prove that one is greater than zero, so we already know it's not equal to it, but in order to prove that it's greater than zero, uh, is that anytime we pick positive numbers a and b, which are real numbers or complex. Uh, we have uh, that a times b is greater than zero. So if you, the product of two positive numbers is also positive. Okay. So you'd have to prove that. 
uh, but we're just going to take it for granted in our proof. Uh, you would also have to prove separately that uh, for any number a, which is in our field, um, its negation, so negative 1 times that, uh, so multiplication by the additive inverse of the identity, right? so 1 plus negative 1 is 0, so this is the additive inverse of the multiplicative identity. Uh, so if you do that, <laughs> if you multiply that by something, uh, then you get the additive inverse of whatever that original thing was. Right? So you can toggle to between positive and negative numbers with multiplication by negative 1. And then the third uh, assertion that we'll need is that when you have a negative number, then negative, that negative number, is greater than 0. Right? So negative, negative 5 is 5, and 5 is greater than 0. Okay, so with those three things, then we can prove this result. Uh, so from uh, the multiplicative identity, 1 and 1 times 1 are the same thing. And then uh, from uh, I believe from this one, we have that this is just another way of writing 1. Right, so we can multiply negative 1 with negative 1 to get 1. Uh, and now we can uh, commute. Right? So one of these goes over here, and the other one pairs up with this one. And so we have negative 1 times 1 times negative 1 times 1. Uh, and then that simplifies, right? These ones, well, this is these are identities. These can just go away. So then we have negative 1 times negative 1. Uh, and so here, uh, if by item two, that if uh, one is less than zero, then negative one and negative one, which is equal to one, right? Uh, well. If 1 is less than 0, then negative 1, right? if 1 is less than 0, then negative 1 is greater than 0 by this property. Okay? Uh, and then we also have that, well, from this, if negative 1 is greater than 0, then negative 1 times negative 1 should also be greater than 0. Okay? So we have negative 1 times negative 1 over here, which from this and this, should be greater than zero, but those are exactly equal to one, right? By this cancellation, by this one. Right? So you can't have that this is less than zero and that this is greater than zero. Right? So again, we have a contradiction. So from this, we see that one must be greater than zero, and it might take you a few times looking it over or you know listening to the explanation again. Uh, and it just kind of reinforces <laughs> what we've already said, that um, the simplest of claims can be just so extremely difficult uh, to prove. Uh, it's, um, it's so much smaller than what we're used to working with that it's, it, it can be a little difficult to uh, make claims against these things that uh, we kind of took for granted whenever we were first learning arithmetic. Uh, okay, so then uh, you know what can we do to prepare ourselves to to prove things uh, you know at large well uh, the thing that was recommended to me and which I'm <laughs> passing on to you is to just uh, build a, a repository of tricks right so uh, there's a few things that mathematicians will do over and over again uh, and um, you know, uh, coming from the outside, it always uh, made me feel a little bit dumb <laughs> whenever I'd see it, like, oh, I should have thought of that, yeah. Uh, but, um, yeah, there's there are some patterns uh, that, uh, you know, if you're stuck on, on a problem, uh, you know, just to get some movement, it's worth you know, kind of going through a checklist of, of things that you've seen work before to see if any of them can help you kind of move the problem, wiggle it a little bit. So... One, we've already seen a couple of examples, is proof by contradiction. 
Uh, so it, it's really easy to do it. Uh, you take a set of previously established theorems and definitions, and then you make a claim which is exactly the opposite of what you're trying to prove. So we were trying to show that one was not equal to zero, and we did that by first asserting that one was equal to zero. Uh, we tried to show that one was greater than zero, and we did that by assuming that one was left less than zero. And then you arrive at uh, a contradiction. Okay. Um, so uh, proof by contradiction, uh, it, uh, it is helpful. <laughs> so. Uh, okay, uh, so next, uh, multiply by one, right? So some clever multiplication of one uh, is sometimes a line. So I like this one is from differential equations. Uh, it's the concept of an integrating factor. If you haven't gotten to it in differential equations or you haven't taken that course, uh, yeah, don't worry. Uh, it, some of the notation should look familiar from calculus. Uh, so it's, it's not a proof, but it's an example of uh, multiplying by one in a really clever way to um, to get past uh, you know, the sticking point. So we have this first order linear differential equation, uh, which is the derivative of y with respect to x, and then it's a product of these two functions, y of x and some function p of x, uh, and that's equal to some value q of x, right? some value, some function which depends on x. Uh, so uh, p and q are continuous. They're in the family of continuous functions. Uh, and the system can be made integral by considering this convenience function. So we're, we're going to take something that already looks kind of nasty, and we're going to multiply it by this function. Uh, and the idea is that um, because we're multiplying uh, in, uh, in kind of a, a clever way, that we can get some result, and we can just sort of account for the fact that we've introduced this into the function that we were interested in to begin with. Uh, so we pick this function because it has this property where if you take the derivative, then its derivative is p of x. Right? Well, we have p of x over here. So how do we take advantage of this? So uh, you can think of this like when we we're completing the square, or uh, you can think of it as something new. But we multiply both sides uh, by the same function, which is essentially multiplying by 1. Uh, and so we have over here. Uh, this derivative of uh, that the derivative of e to this function v of x times y of x uh, is equal to uh, well this factors out ultimately right, because it's uh, in both sides so it's the uh, left hand times the derivative of the right plus the derivative of the left times the right so over here this times the derivative of the right, right, so these two multiply together, and then over here is the derivative of the left times the right, so this is unchanged, right, y of x, and the derivative of this is uh, e to the v of x times the derivative of v of x. Well, the derivative of v of x was p of x, right? So because this appears in both terms, we factor it out, and then we see that this, well, this was originally q of x, right? So now we have that uh, this uh, e to the v of x times q of x is equal to this integral. And so that this was really just this uh, participant in a, a larger differential equation. Right? And we saw that with this clever multiplication. Um, okay, so then by the product rule, uh, we integrate both sides uh, with respect to x, moving the integrated factor from the left hand side to the right hand side. We can now solve for y of x, which was uh, kind of the goal in that problem. Uh, so, uh, okay, so that's an example of multiplying by 1. Uh, it's not always as, as trivial as it sounds, uh, as it seems like it should be, whatever you say it. Uh, but uh, if you can find the clever means by which you can multiply by 1, uh, then you can work your way through some of these problems. Another possible approach is to add zero. Uh, so uh, let's add zero as we uh, complete the square. Okay. So the proof of the quadratic formula utilizes the quote, clever trick of addition by zero. So you start with a degree two polynomial and manipulate it to be monic. So we just divide by a. So we have just this one times whatever our largest term is, one times x squared. Uh, okay, 
Uh, and then now the clever trick we add zero but zero has the form of b squared divided by 4a squared right? and that's chosen because this part right, if we just include the addition right, forms this nice perfect square with uh, our x squared and x terms and this part the subtraction uh, forms this junk <laughs> with uh, c divided by a uh, which was just kind of hanging out before and made no guarantees of, of giving us a perfect square so if we group this really nice perfect square and we group this junk together and we move the junk to the right hand side and we have this perfect square on the left hand side and we still have junk on the right hand side <laughs> but if we solve for x right, uh, then you know this simplifies we multiply so we get a common denominator and then we have then we take the square root, we get plus or minus the square root. Uh, and then uh, on the left hand side we now have x plus b over 2a. And we solve for x by moving this to the right hand side. Right? Well this is a perfect square, so the denominator is 2a. And then on the numerator we have negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. Right? And so all of that was achieved by adding the right value of zero. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, another possibility uh, is to uh, to count. So, um, you know, show that the rational numbers have a, a one to one correspondence with the natural numbers, and hence the same order of infinity. Uh, okay, um, so uh, correspondence is, uh, you know, that is the proof that. It, um, a lot of the time that shows that this thing that has already been solved is exactly the same as this other thing that you're trying to solve. And if you can show this one-to-one -one correspondence between all of the states or, or all of the possibilities, uh, then you show that the truths that apply to the thing that's already been established will also apply to this new thing. And so you've, um, you've connected it to this solved set you've, uh, by counting, by creating this one-to-one -one uh, relationship uh, and so whenever you're dealing with infinity uh, the ability to show one-to-one -one correspondence um, is going to be how you show that two sets are equal or you know in this case that two sets are not equal uh, so for this one showing that the rational numbers and the natural numbers uh, have a one-to-one -one correspondence um, here let's see if we can do that uh, okay so uh, so over here we have the natural numbers uh, and then over here uh, we have the rational numbers um, and so rational numbers are um, They're p divided by q. They're all of that form, uh, and it's possible <laughs> that we may uh, establish some uh, repeat numbers here. Um, but you know, hypothetically, if you were interested, you could uh, filter those out, or, or you could come up with some means of, of um, not repeating them. Um, okay. So uh, actually, this is not exactly. What what we want is something like zero, okay. and then this big infinite matrix where the numerator Where the numerator is increased on the rows and the denominator is increased on the, uh, sorry, the numerator increases across the columns and the denominator increases across the rows.
Uh, and so you can see you have, you know, in that first row, one, two, three, four. So you get all the natural numbers in the first row. And then you get uh, the natural numbers divided by two in the second row, the natural numbers divided by three in the third row, and so on and so forth. And then you visit these values in this diagonal pattern. Where you just divide it up into these diagonals and then you come down and then go back up and you come down. And this provides an ordering, right? And if you have an ordering that accounts for every element in your set, um, then, and your set is infinite, then you have this one to one correspondence with the natural numbers. So you could pick any, uh, you could order them in this manner, and then for, for all of the positive values for all the values greater than zero, uh, then you could um, you could give some serial number for when this visitation pattern would map or uh, whenever any rational number, right? so 10 billion divided by 73, uh, whenever that number would occur would first occur in this visitation pattern. And if you're not satisfied because it doesn't include the negative numbers, uh, then imagine this, right? So we say zero goes first. And then each time we complete a diagonal, then we have the negative numbers, right? So then we have this twin pairing matrix where, okay, zero goes first, and then you do this diagonal, and then you do the same diagonal for the negative matrix. Right? And then uh, where every entry is the negative of this positive matrix. Then you do the second diagonal, and then you do the negatives one, and then you do the third diagonal, and then you do the negatives one. And so we still have this ordering where you could pick any number, positive or num negative or zero, uh, and then we could tell you through this sorting, through this pattern of visitation, when that number would occur. And so because it has that serial number when it would first occur, uh, then it... Um, it has this one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers, and so, uh, and so we say that those two sets, even though they're both infinite, uh, are the same size, and that leads to a natural question. Well, uh, okay, is there a bigger infinity? You know, are are all fin infinities uh, made born equal, <laughs> right? Uh, and uh, there is a bigger infinity, uh, so it's the the cardinality of the continuum. It's uh, the infinite or the the real numbers themselves, um, and so for this one, we're again going to use a a diagonalization argument, but we're going to use it in the inverse. So. Okay, uh, so now we've seen that it's possible that if you have something that's the size of the natural numbers, so infinite but uh, serializable, then uh, then you can group them into an array. And so it's got infinite rows and it's got infinite columns, and the only way to kind of travel along the array, if you go along the row, you'll get lost in that affinity. If you go along the column, you'll get lost in that affinity. So just like before, you have to kind of visit it in these diagonal patterns. And so Cantor uh, came up with this argument for uh, if you made something like a matrix out of the numbers between 0 and 1, out of the real numbers. So not inclusive, you don't include 0 or 1, but all of the real numbers between 0 and 1.
Uh, then, you know, this first one, this is all zeros, so you can just ignore that. Uh, or, you know, whenever you construct your number, you can, um, you can just prefix it with zero point. Right? So we're going to construct a number which is not in this set. Right? So we only have three numbers. It shouldn't be too difficult. Uh, but we'll see you know, what the rules are for this. So it should be between 0 and 1. So we start with that, just like uh, we said. Uh, and so now we're going to look at the first decimal value of the first number. Right? And we're going to pick anything but that number. So we've listed a 1. Let's do a 0. Okay. Uh, and then here, uh, we've listed a 2. Uh, so we can pick anything but a 2. So 0, 1, 3 through 9. Uh, but uh, let's do, let's make it simple. Let's pick a 1 whenever there's not a 1, and then uh, there's a 0 whenever it is 1. Right? Just simple rules. So then, uh, right, so this one, the second number, uh, is not a 1. So we're going to consider the second uh, digit beyond the decimal of the second number. We're going to pick something different. And then we're going to consider the third digit of the third number. And so we can go down this, this line. And you know we just talked about lexicographic comparisons. Uh, and we have that these two numbers are not equal because they're first, the first number that we compare, uh, they're not going to be equal. We also know that it's not the same as the second number because those two values are not equal. Right? It differs in that second decimal place. And then here, it differs in the third decimal place from that third number. And so regardless of what is going on elsewhere, we're guaranteed that it differs in one decimal place for every number in the list. So whatever order we visit them, we can always construct another number that was not in that original set. Right? And we could do this infinitely many times. Uh, and so I, I chose 0 and 1 to show that the, this holds even in the, the binary case. So the larger, like using this argument, right? So over here, there's always nine digits that are not the same as whatever one is presented by the current number. Uh, and so this suggests this inflation that, you know, the real number should be, um, you know, nine times larger than than the rational numbers or whatever. But that's arbitrary, right? If we had done it in hexadecimal, then there would be 15 choices uh, that are different from the current value, from the current hex value. Uh, and you know, we could kind of blow up the real numbers as, as large as we want by picking larger and larger base numbers um, for storing our, our numbers. Um, having said that, there are significantly more real numbers than there are uh, the natural numbers. Um, and so this demonstrates that you could never capture them all in some some iterable list the way that you can the rational numbers. Uh, and so this failure to generate this correspondence, this one-to-one -one correspondence, uh, is a proof that the real numbers, the, the infinite set of real numbers, are larger uh, than uh, the infinite set of natural numbers or the infinite set of, of rational numbers. Okay. Uh, okay, so now uh, another pattern uh, for constructing these proofs is to consider it uh, as uh, a value moves towards its limit. Uh, so uh, sometimes uh, as a value approaches its limit, uh, we find that something, some previously undefined value can be replaced with a well-defined value such as uh, the case here where we have sine of x, which is 0 whenever x is 0, uh, and then divided by x, which is 0 whenever x is 0. So this limit actually resolves to the value 1 uh, as x tends to 0. Uh, and so uh, typically, whenever you divide by 0, or you know, whenever you have just 1 over x, you see that it shoots off to positive infinity when you approach it from the 
the right hand side from the positive numbers and negative infinity when you approach zero from the left hand side. Um, but here, uh, you know, it, uh, it actually gets cleaned up and uh, there's this, the negative values uh, between zero and uh, pi cancel out, or negative pi cancel out so that it's symmetric about the, um, the vertical axis at the origin. Um, and uh, again, it, it resolves to one. Uh, so removing singularities, uh, if you have a, a problem which is ill-defined because of certain infinities, then limits are going to be um, uh, of extreme use. So you have to clean up essentially everywhere that it's undefined, otherwise it's, uh, it's not going to be defined and you can't make your statements on the entire space. Uh, and so you have to treat them individually. So this turns out to be uh, as a uh, common occurrence uh, whenever you're, you're trying to just clean up a problem to discuss it. So, uh, and then uh, another thing uh, which we'll look at whenever we discuss the Basel problem uh, is to uh, represent the problem using infinite series. So some problems are solved by continuously refined approximation. Uh, for example, continuously compound interest uh, is evaluating using the exponential function, and the exponential function is given in terms of uh, this infinite series. Uh, and uh, it is this, uh, the function which is idempotent under the action of uh, differentiation. <laughs> so you can take however many derivatives you want of e to the x and it's still always going to be, and, and the value of the derivative you know, the 10th derivative, the 100th derivative, the millionth derivative is exactly the same as the original function at that point. Right? So this function is unique for that property. And then uh, it turns out to, to show up all over the place um, because the series expansion turns out to be really important. Uh, and then because the function itself turns out to be really important. Uh, and then, of course, this is the formula for compound interest. Right? So the total balance is equal to the principal balance, the, the initial investment uh, times E raised to the interest rate times time, where time is the number of years, uh, and the interest rate's usually between zero and one. Um, but anyway, so infinite series will uh, take a look at expanding functions into this form uh, and how that can help to, um, uh, to visualize uh, what's happening, right? This, this, this form kind of obscures a little bit of what the function is doing. And here, uh, because it's a polynomial, and those are familiar, uh, we can kind of understand a little bit more um, what's happening whenever we're comparing values, uh, either in a limiting case or, uh, again, with the Basel problem, uh, just whenever we're trying to, uh, to establish this, uh, this remarkable result. Um, so we'll, we'll use that there. Uh, okay, so back to computer science. So most problems that we'll deal with right, uh, are gonna be in the counting variety. So you just have to understand, you know, uh, what is going to happen to, to your data, to your code, uh, you know, in terms of being able to handle user activity as the number of users gets large or as the amount of activity gets large. Uh, Right, so uh, that's kind of the nature of the subject because machines or computers are, are really good at computing uh, these discrete, these integral values. They're really good at counting it. They can count really, really quickly. Uh, and so we have to do our best to map whatever problem we're dealing with into something that a computer can deal with. Um, and uh, the, it comes back to uh, these discrete, these integral valued problems. Uh, okay, so, uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, proving our code, we, we can define that in terms of how our program responds uh, to uh, best average and worst case scenarios, and then uh, as well as, as the input and usage uh, increases, uh, so as the strain on our program uh, increases. Uh, so the first step for that is to imagine that a solution is possible right? uh, and uh, if uh, if you can't 
get past this step, the, you know, there's not really a point in continuing on uh, after that. Uh, it, if you can't uh, imagine the possibility of success, then uh, you um, then you're essentially doing everything in your own power to make sure that you will not succeed. So, so you got to believe that you can do it, uh, and then. Uh, it's a little more complicated than saying the result follows, but uh, you you must first believe that you could do it, uh, and then the work follows, uh, and with uh, with hard work and good fortune, the result will follow. Okay, so uh, in terms of writing a formal proof, I recommend revisiting the definitions. Right? So every time that uh, uh, that. I have to construct a proof on my own. The first thing that I do is um, I explicitly restate the claim. So just uh, on its own page, I restate the claim, you know, uh, such as uh, this assertion: the set of permutations acting on a collection of size n constitutes a group. Right? So that's an assertion. I would start that at the top of the page, and then I would define everything in here. Uh, Right, so uh, the set of permutations. What is a group action? Um, you know, what is a, a permutation group of size n? Uh, everything that would uh, that doesn't rely basically on any thought. Right. So uh, definitions are just the language that we use to describe these concepts. Uh, and um, you know, uh, sometimes I, I feel just a bit slow in picking up on the definitions, and so I, I write them over and over again in order to kind of drill it into my brain. But then to also make it explicitly clear that, uh, you know, if this turns out to be a really simple assertion, you know, sometimes it follows right from the definition. So you write down the definition and it says, you know, a, a set of size n is defined or, you know, uh, is acted on by the group of permutations using in factorial uh, distinct members of the set right? or, or something like that. Um, and, and so you can just get it, you can get the result kind of cheaply. Right? It, it turns out to be essentially exactly what the definition is claiming or, or something very closely related. Um, but you know, you, you can only help yourself by, uh, by understanding what exactly it is it, that's being claimed uh, and then you kind of go to work on uh, on proving it. But for me, this is always the first step. Just like I always begin with Hello World, uh, whenever I'm writing a program, whenever I'm writing a proof, I always begin by defining uh, anything that's related to the, the result I'm trying to prove. Uh, and you know, I, I guess it uh, that is also similar to whenever I'm in uh, active development of a program, uh, I uh, begin by identifying the nouns within the problem, and those tend to become my classes. So whenever we we're creating uh, graphs, uh, graphs are defined as a collection of vertices and uh, edges. And so I create a graph class, I create a vertex class, and I create an edge class, and then uh, the graph has a collection of vertices and a collection of edges. And so, again, like it, it follows from the definition. And so, uh, these are some of the patterns that I've uh, developed for myself over time. And uh, hopefully, <laughs> it's helpful to you to hear it. Uh, and if not, you know that it's nice to tune out and <laughs> have something that you will be tested on later. Right. Um, okay. Um, and so you can read the sections uh, more if you're interested. Um, and then uh, I also find it helpful to write code. Uh, so, you know, for problems in general, um, or you know, if I'm trying to prove something as well, uh, I I try to visualize it, uh, and so I, I do my best to write code that will help me visualize the problem. It, um, you know, through habit and uh, work, I've kind of developed this link between um, learning to understand a problem through writing code. It's just a, another way of explaining what's happening. Uh, you know, in this case, I'm explaining it to a, or, you know, via a programming language. Um, but there's this certain rigidity in 
writing code where you have to be extremely precise in, in what it is that you're claiming uh, and um, you know, just through practice it it's become a, a comfortable way for me to express and interpret ideas but the benefit and the payoff from from all of that work is that uh, whenever I have something that I have a definition of but I'm not exactly sure what it's doing uh, I can I can write code in, in one of these languages in R and Python and in MATLAB or you know JavaScript or, or whatever uh, and uh, I can pass the problem <laughs> to the computer and then have it uh, generate this visualization uh, and it's not uh, it's never straightforward it's always kind of this thing that you have to grind out to get just a little bit more information and then it's like the lights come on and you get to see the output of your program, uh, and it um, and it can really help if you've uh, you know if uh, you've identified the right data to visualize and, and you found uh, a, a clever way to represent it, uh, then it can really help you to understand the problem. And once you've engaged uh, the the visual center of, of your mind. Uh, that like you're you're taking advantage <laughs> essentially of your own biology so much of our brain is is allocated to processing visual cues um, that uh, it uh, really tends to move the problem forward once you have that data visualization so uh, so writing code can be a way to move forward on um, on problems in general or, or proofs uh, if you're uh, not <laughs> if you just want to know whether or not the thing that you're asserting is going to hold up right? to make sure that you're not wasting your time to try and prove something uh, that isn't true that, that can be quickly demonstrated to be not true uh, or you know sometimes it'll provide you the insight as to why this thing that you're you think is true is going to hold up okay. uh, and then the last advice I have is uh, you know don't get stuck uh, so um, you know whether or not you um, you know exactly from the beginning where it is that you want to go or, or where you want to take the problem uh, it uh, that is going to be more rare right? like you can have this intuition for, for where you think you should go but the the trick is that whenever something whenever you try something and it doesn't work out to your favor uh, to get back up quickly so you know, it, it's important not to, you know, to just lay on the ground and, and slowly die uh, whenever uh, it, whatever things don't go your way. You have to pick yourself up and, and do something, you know, uh, do some activity to, to get moving. Right? Uh, so whenever, uh, you know, whenever something happens for me, there's uh, always something around the house that I can do. I, I've either got you know, dishes or, or you know, I can go for a run or a bike ride or, or whatever, just something to, to get moving, to, to distance myself, uh, you know, physically, emotionally, whatever, from whatever that most recent setback is. Uh, and then I find that the movement and, and the work, you know, the physical labor tends to free up my mind to, to think about the problem again. Uh, and it, it gets me moving again. And so that, uh, you know, it, it uh, doesn't necessarily have to be more work, uh, you know, um, straight at, you know, straight line work uh, against the problem. It, it can be uh, lateral, but you got to move. Uh, but it can still be that, right? Like you can go over your notes again or, or skim through your textbook or reread definitions or theorems or, you know, just glancing around to see if there's uh, some other approach that that can help you out uh, but um, you know uh, despair <laughs> is never going to get you through the problem you it, it's going to be work that makes the difference between whatever that most recent failure is and your eventual success and so uh, you know picking yourself up and and finding any work right whether it's the dishes or taking a shower or, or anything um, it is still going to be more helpful than you know, banging your head in the desk or, or lying on the ground uh, and 
<laughs> you know, just waiting for circumstances to change, right? You, you got to get moving. You got to do something. Right? So whatever, whenever you get hit, just don't get stuck there. Right? Uh, okay, so we have just enough time, I think, uh, to discuss uh, the to discuss the basil problem. And uh, if we don't finish it, we'll finish it next time. Uh, okay, so uh, the the basil problem um, was a follow up to the harmonic series. So uh, it became clear that the harmonic series diverged. Right? If you remember, uh, we have um, one plus a half plus a third plus a fourth, and so on, and all. Uh, all of the natural numbers, the reciprocal of all of the natural numbers from 1 to infinity. If you add them all up, uh, the result goes off to infinity. Um, using shorthand here, I'll drop in limits. So you know, say that something equals infinity where it, when it tends to infinity. You know, whatever, right? So, But this is the result of the harmonic series. And so the follow-up was, uh, okay, well, what if our function, instead of being 1 over n, is 1 over n squared. What if we increase the denominator even faster? Uh, and so then instead of this, you would get 1 squared plus 1 half squared plus 1 third squared and so on. And it's the sum of all of the numbers 1 over n squared from 1 to infinity. And that equals what? Uh, you know, go ahead and take a second and think about it. What do you think that equals? Um, and uh, you know, uh, unless you've seen it before, uh, <laughs> then uh, you probably wouldn't know to guess that this is equal to pi squared over six. Uh, so it. Um, it's a curious result, right? How how do you come by that? It's not exactly clear, uh, you know, just by looking at it, why that should be so. Uh, and so the the problem sat around for a while. Uh, I think it was clear pretty early on that it was going to converge to some finite value, um, but it wasn't clear what that was. And so uh, it became this sort of prize problem that sat out there. Uh, for you know, several years, and then uh, eventually a, a man named Leonard Euler came along, and he extended the precision of the answer uh, from like 14 digits to 18, and then you know 20 something, and then like 30 or 40 something, and then eventually he solved it outright, and that was over the course of uh, several years. I think whenever he was 27, he finally got it. Um, but he went off, uh, you know, he, he left his hometown to go study mathematics. Uh, I forget which city it was. Uh, I want to say he went somewhere in Prussia. Um, and uh, so he went, he became this, uh, you know, foreign student uh, and just trying to prove himself. And he, he saw this problem as a great opportunity for him to do that. And so he continued to add precision to the answer, but he wanted something uh, that, that was a true solution. And so uh, you know, you can imagine that it, since he kept going back and, and refining his result, that it was always on his mind. He was always trying to think of what this this uh, clean solution uh, for for an answer uh, must have been. And so, you know, you can just picture it there in the back of his mind. Every time he's encountering a problem, he's you know reviewing it with this in mind, wondering whether or not it's going to have some hint as to uh, how he can eventually solve this. And so, after several years after uh, somewhere between three and eleven years I don't remember the exact number but but after several years uh, so he uh, you know, he, he becomes he goes off you know abroad to study at 16 I think at 27 
uh, he finally gets the, the proper answer for this. And so the, the trick he uses is a, a series expansion. Um, okay, so before we get to that, um, let's uh, take a look at just polynomials in general, right? So whenever you factor a polynomial, So you can write it like this, or uh, you can multiply it out. Uh, or, uh, as was fashionable at that time, uh, you can uh, divide out these constants individually, right? so that this Uh, and then, because they're just constants, um, I mean, you can multiply this 1 over A and 1 over B together. Uh, and then you can um, multiply both sides by A times B. And because it's 0 over here, you know, it doesn't do anything. And because it's uh, A and 1 over A times B in the denom or, you know, 1 over A times B on the left hand side, then multiplying by A times B would just cancel it out and you get 1. Um, and so it's just a scaled version uh, of this, uh, the way we've chosen to represent this polynomial. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is one representation, and this is a, another representation, but they're related in that they're just these scaled versions of each other, but they still have zeros, uh, they, they still cross the x-axis at the same points. Uh, it's just the amount that they rise and fall uh, above and below the uh, that horizontal axis uh, varies based on, on this. Yeah. Uh, but this is just a, a, another valid one. They, they still have the same roots and so uh, in that sense they're uh, you can say they're from the same family or you can say that they're the same function essentially. Uh, okay so but I want you to see this that this is a way to write polynomials. Right? Uh, okay. So the insight that after several years Euler used to solve the Basel problem uh, was uh, from the series expansion and he related it to, um, to polynomials. So the series expansion for sine So it's, it's all of the odd terms uh, when you alternate sign of, <laughs> well, uh, it, it's all, uh, it's related to e to the x, right? So in e to the x, we took all of the polynomial terms uh, from, uh, you know, x to the 0, x to the 1, x squared, x cubed, and so forth, right? Uh, all of these uh, powers of x, and then uh, each power of x was desired, divided by its exponent factorial. Right? So, uh, uh, 
right? Uh, and so um, 1 plus x divided by 1 factorial plus x squared divided by 2 factorial plus x cubed divided by 3 factorial and so forth. And so you do that all the way off to infinity. And as you get sufficiently large, um, those terms, the factorial term, eventually dwarfs you know x to the 10 million or whatever. Uh, so 10 million factorial is, is significantly larger. Uh, so that it, it, you know, it, it just becomes so insignificantly small that those later terms eventually don't matter. Uh, and how far you have to go before you get to that tail, those values where you can just kind of drop it off without losing anything, is dependent on x. So the larger x, the larger your uh, denominators have to be to, to dwarf uh, you know, x to that power divided by the factorial. Um, so that's kind of what's happening under the hood with the e to the x, right? You can kind of see it a little more clearly uh, with this representation. Um, and then uh, if you, uh, if you, instead of uh, raising it to the power x, if you raise it to a complex number, so e to the i, like if you say let x equal i times theta, okay, then this, just by algebraic substitution becomes e to the i theta and then everywhere you see x you replace it with i theta So now it's 1 plus i theta plus i theta squared over 2 factorial plus i theta cubed over 3 factorial. Um, but you can simplify these because i squared is negative 1. So anywhere that the, uh, the power of i is greater, than, uh, is greater than 1, you can simplify it um, to either i, negative i, 1, or negative 1. So we do that. then we end up with uh, a bunch of terms where all of the even ones are real values and all of the odd ones have this i sitting in front of it, this factor of i. But So we can break them into those two collections, the even terms and the odd terms. And it turns out that the, the even terms are cosine, right? 1 plus uh, x squared over 2 factorial, or uh, Sorry, 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial minus x to the 6 over 6 factorial plus x to the 8 over 8 factorial minus 10, x to the 10 over 10 factorial and so on and so forth, right? All of the even terms, those are cosine and they alternate in sign each time. And then uh, all of the odd ones, so i times theta minus i times theta cubed over 3 factorial plus i times theta to the fifth over five factorial uh, minus i times theta to the seventh over seven factorial plus i times theta to the ninth over nine factorial and so on and so forth. All those odd terms, they have this constant i sitting out there. But it's then, but if you factor that out, then you have i times what turns out to be sine of theta. So that e to the i theta is in fact equal to cosine of theta plus i times sine of theta, right? And so that's uh, Euler's uh, identity or, or his equation. 
And so uh, if you plug in pi, then you get e to the i pi is equal to negative 1 plus uh, i times 0, if you want to include that. Uh, but that's where that equation comes from. It comes from this series expansion when you plug in i times theta. Okay. Um, so obviously he was interested in, in these uh, series expansions. But just considering the sine of x part right, with the odd terms of alternating sine, Uh, then uh, we have it in its series form right? uh, but he also believed that uh, these functions could uh, could be written in in either polynomial form or as a product of polynomials which would again still be uh, a polynomial and so polynomials could be reduced to the product of their roots right so Right. This is a representation of a polynomial, as is uh, where uh, where we can see how uh, where the zeros in that polynomial function would come from, uh, just by looking at their factors, and so. Uh, you know, it's not clear where the zeros are when you look at the series expansion. But sine of x, well, sine of x is zero whenever x is zero or uh, some other multiple of pi. Pi, two pi, three pi, negative pi. Uh, and so he could write it like that. He could just rewrite the function like that. So then if he wrote it as a zero or as a, a product of its zeros, then he would get something So this right hand side would be zero whenever x is zero. It'd be zero whenever x is pi. It'd be zero whenever x is negative pi. Uh, and then we continue to add on terms, right? Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then each of these would kind of pair up. Then we would multiply 1 plus or minus x over pi, and we would get uh, and then 1 plus or minus x over 2 pi. Uh, and then 3 pi, right? plus or minus 3 pi. Uh, and so on and so forth. Well, we have this x that sits out in front, right? Because sine of x is 0 at x equals 0. Um, but the rest of these, he noticed this sequence, right? So these are those natural numbers that we were looking at before. 1, 2 squared, 3 squared, and they're in the denominator. So is there some way that he could manipulate this right, to isolate that summation, that 1 plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared, and so on and so forth? The, uh, the Basel problem, right? those terms, the sum of the inverse uh, of the natural, <laughs> of the inverse square of all of the natural numbers, right? Um, well, they're sitting right here, so how can he relate them to get that result, that pi squared over 6 result that we discussed earlier? Uh, and uh, we're a little bit over on time, so we'll have to, to pick up there next time. Um, but uh, this was you know, how, how we started out with that, and then once he had that, he 
did some manipulations, which we'll go over next time. Uh, okay, well, uh, I've already taken up too much time, so I will speak to you all on Thursday.